All right. I, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. I never, ever would have imagined that I would have the chance to speak at House Gryffindor. <laughs> Wait, is this not, is this, is this the wrong house? Is this not a Slyther Slytherin or another one? I, uh, I visited Oxford, geez, 12 years ago, 13 years ago as a tourist. And, uh, and I realized then, what I still realize now, is there's no way in hell I ever would have gotten in here, but it's really nice to imagine uh, being in a place that has obviously valued and treasured and appreciated knowledge for as long as this place has. Uh, and it's not a safety school like Cambridge. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I have just, I've just managed to get myself never invited to Cambridge. Oh well. Um, one of my good friends and a very smart guy, um, Harge, with whom I did a lot of investing at YC. Now he started a startup now as an Oxford graduate. And so I'd ask him the most obnoxious questions about what it was like being a student here and all this stuff. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the stories because you obviously already know what it's like to be students here. Um, but I've always kind of been fascinated from afar and uh, it is very cool to be speaking here. So I've got about, I'd say 15 minutes worth of slides. I don't have a clicker, so I'll be doing this weird pointing thing uh, to advance the slides, thank you. And, um, uh, and then I want to get into Q&A because, uh, well, you know, I made Reddit, so I want you all to have a chance to ask me anything. And, uh, but first, I want to give you a brief overview for those of you who may not be Redditors. Uh, actually, just by show of hands, how many of you Reddit? Great, upvote, 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 <laughs> upvote. Uh, and thank you for now identifying yourselves as the least productive people here. <laughs> so, good luck graduating. Uh, mm, I, uh, I wanted to dig in a little bit to some of the numbers behind Reddit. Um, it is a global platform, uh, but one that is still primarily uh, Anglophone. And it's not for lack of interest, it's just because we have so much other stuff to get right uh, that we haven't had time to internationalize yet. But, uh, I'll do sound effects too. There are tens of thousands of communities on Reddit. You can go create one right now uh, for whatever your interest, whatever your hobby, whatever your passion, and people come to these forums to discuss the most interesting news about that stuff. The best content gets voted up, uh, democracy, Eh, not perfect, uh, but it's the best system we got. I'm butchering that Churchill quote, but you know what I mean. And there's a community for everything. There's beards. Uh, if you're interested in beards, even if you don't have a beard, but maybe aspire to have a beard or just like beards, um, they grow on you if you don't know. And okay, you don't like puns. That's fine. That's fine. You've got uh, food porn, for instance. That's safe for work. Don't worry. It's just beautiful high-res photos of food that people make and share with one another. And what's unique about Reddit is we, we identify people only by their, their sort of alter ego, by a pseudonym, by a username. It's not the name on your government birth certificate or whatever. Um, it's a username you make up. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a homemade quesalupa, uh, which is a very traditional Mexican dish that Taco Bell made. <laughs> Uh, that you just got to imagine, like it's, it. oh, you can see little, yeah, just this cheesy goodness. Anyway, this was made by a random person uh, named, or whose username is JLambs0004. And she worked really hard to make this great quesalupa. She didn't share it on Instagram. She didn't share it on Facebook. She shared it on r slash food porn with a bunch of people with whom she has no real connection outside of their shared interest. And this is interesting because you would think she would want all the, the sort of social credit for this, right? She'd want to post it on Instagram, spend 10 minutes filtering it so it looks perfect, so that all of her friends know she's amazing at making quesalupas. But what we've seen for the last 10 years of social media has basically been, what I would argue, uh, the, the cocktail party. Uh, it has been the, the most superficial level of connection. Now, it's something we need. I don't say that derisively. Like, we like cocktail parties. As humans, we like showing people how cute our pets are and how wonderful our life is. And, and that's a level of connection that, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't go very deep. Um, but it's still a, a pretty important one for us, and clearly people are doing it. What we're seeing on platforms like Reddit, Snapchat, 
is a hunger for what I think is the next wave of it, which is a demand for authenticity, which is the fact that now we have all these infinite channels for us to see how clever someone can be on Twitter, or how great a photographer or creative they are on Instagram, or how whatever they might be on Facebook, um, that we're craving something that feels more real. That's not there because of wanting to show a filtered version of yourself, um, but wanting to show really how you are in that moment, how you're feeling. A lot of these things don't happen unless you have a certain amount of security. And that security either takes lots of time, or alcohol, or, or some extreme circumstance where you feel like you can really open up and share. And that's a lot of friction. And yet that is what we as people really crave. And what we do using usernames allows people instantly to feel that security and comfort sharing and expressing themselves fully. And what's amazing is this is a population that's it's, it's actually bigger than Brazil. 250 million people use Reddit every month. And of all those people and all those discussions, 99.98% of it is never reported by another user for being a violation of our content policy. So, Hundreds of millions of people, literally a quarter of a billion people coming every month to converse, to share, to debate, to whatever, and only 0.02% of the time is this content reported uh, as being problematic. And we've developed a content policy, we've built a great community team, a trust and safety team, but the moral of this story is that in fact, even hundreds of millions of people, when given the chance to share with this kind of accountability, right, it's not your driver's license name, but it's a username, it's still an identity, still feel an attachment to it. And this is something we didn't intend to build, but we've seen happen now at scale. And the result is people open up. They're willing to talk about the struggles they're having in their marriage, the problems they're dealing with uh, confronting their sexuality in the community they live in, um, or just silly random things that they couldn't just post on Facebook. Uh, a good example would be this. This is an entire community. It's called r slash British problems. <laughs> There's r slash first world problems, you can imagine what that is. r slash British problems, though, are very, very unique uh, to Brits. You'll see that one of the top voted ones would be a good example here. Uh, click. This one, I paid 72 pounds for this train ticket and nobody has checked it once. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand that. Um, and there was an update. Uh, this is user NNSE3. Update, a conductor has just asked me where I'm going, didn't check my ticket. It's getting to the point that I hope someone does, just so I can validate carrying four strips of thin orange and white plastic in my wallet. <laughs> this was not some well-paid writer. This was not probably, maybe, though a lot of hands went up, probably not an Oxford graduate. This is just someone somewhere in the world, probably British, <laughs> or at least aware of British culture, coming up with something not to impress their friends or college mates on Facebook, but for a community of people who all share this, I don't know, joy of laughing about uniquely British problems. Um, and this content ends up being some of the most interesting on the internet. That's how it's grown to the size that it has. Like I said, a quarter of a billion people every month. Uh, you heard about Reddit's global presence in the United States. We're now number eight largest website. Um, the big numbers for me, though, are the 12 minutes per session. It's a lot of time spent invested on the site, maybe more than you probably should. 53% uh, men, 47% women, so almost 50-50, and 87% under 35, so very, very, very heavily millennial and younger, which probably shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, but like I said, I think this is something that not just millennials want, but that people want. Uh, people don't actually like bullshit. You can ask like a room full of people, raise your hand if you like bullshit. Not many hands go up. Uh, that's because it's not something unique to millennials, it's just something that we're particularly sensitive to. Um, and we live in an age where we have infinite choice for content. Uh, there was a time when it was really hard to get content in front of an audience, and now it's trivial. Uh, and that's a really world-changing thing, right? A 10-year-old with a smartphone can take a video of her puppy, and it will get more views than a company that's invested millions of dollars in something they really want people to see badly. Um, but that's a, that's a world I'm happy to live in, because puppies are great. Speaking of which, this young man, uh, this was me, uh, 16, clearly spending a lot of time on my computer. Uh, and also this haircut, by the way, is gonna come back. I, it's, there's a hipster somewhere right now making this look cool again. Just you wait and see. Um, this was around the age when I got a computer and an internet connection, and I first started learning uh, from strangers. <laughs> I learned HTML from a bunch of just random people on message boards who were willing to answer my questions. And it wasn't long before I started using these skills on GeoCities to build websites for adults 
who had no idea that I was a teenager in my parents' house, in my bedroom, late at night, writing code. They just thought I was like some kind of wizard because I could do this thing that no one else knew how to do. Believe me, my websites were heinous. I mean, they were really ugly. But it was a <laughs> skill that I could learn for free from a bunch of random people on the internet that was a lot more real than whatever it was I was learning in high school. Uh, and certainly a lot more applicable, like instantly. It, it gave me this sense of validation, and that's how I got hooked in technology. And so it just kind of snowballed until uh, I was confronted with these, my third year of university at the University of Virginia, uh, lines. Uh, lines really pissed me off, and I thought I was going to be a lawyer for two years, and then I walked out of an LSAT. That's the, the requisite test you have to take to get into law school in the States. I walked out of it so that I could go eat a waffle. That, you guys have waffles here, right? Like, <laughs> Belgians invented it. I figure they made it over here, too. Like, the thing uh, about it, and this is really hard. To, if you've never spent any time in the American South, you won't really truly appreciate a waffle house. 24-hour, um, <laughs> very, very cheap, but very, very delicious and satisfying establishment where you can get, believe it or not, waffles in a variety of forms. Uh, you can also go like at three in the morning and get the most eclectic group of people you will ever see getting late night food. But I go there for inspiration and that particular day I went because I hated this LSAT and I wanted some food. And I realized if I chose waffles over this test, I probably shouldn't be a lawyer. And I went back to my dorm and I said, Steve, this was the guy I, I actually lived across the hall from my first year of college. I said, we should do something together. Let's build a company. And he was a far better programmer than I, and I talked him out of his programming job to start this thing with me to end these forever. And we thought, okay, it's 2004, here is the smartest phone in the world, the Palm Trio. <laughs> what's, what's really depressing to me is there are probably people who have no idea what this thing is because I'm actually that old. But trust me, this was a thing that was really meaningful for a little bit. It had a stylus, it was crazy, who knows, it was a wild age. And we thought, all right, this is a game changer. We can let people skip lines by ordering from their phones. You'll never have to wait in line again because you're four, four blocks from uh, uh, Cafe Nero, yeah? And you just want to place the order. No, don't like, okay, <laughs> Starbucks. Uh, and you want to wait in line, so you just place the order, and then boom, it's waiting for you. Yeah, I'm Alexis, get your latte, you go. We thought, okay, this is the future. It's going to be amazing. We're going to call this company My Mobile Menu, or mmm. <laughs> I was very proud of this name. Spent a lot of time on this name. Registered the domain name. And our senior year spring break, uh, which is a very special time in the life of an American college student, that's when you go to usually Mexico, get really drunk on cheap alcohol, and make bad decisions. Um, for our senior year spring break, we went to Boston to meet this guy named Paul Graham. He was giving a talk uh, at, um, I can't remember the name of the school. Uh, it's a community college, Harvard, and <laughs> it was called How to Start a Startup. And we thought, oh, this is perfect. Like, no one's talking about this. Now it's 2005, so there's really, we knew Zuckerberg was doing his thing with Facebook, but no one really took it seriously. There was no one talking about how to start a startup, and we were just two dumb college kids who had no guidance. And so we heard him speak. I caught up with him afterwards. I said, Paul, I got to get you a cup of coffee. Let's pitch you on this company. We came up from Virginia. This was like a four-hour train ride, and he was like, all right pitch me. We met him for coffee that night. I pitched him on mmm. He loved it. He said, this is brilliant. It's going to change the world. No more lines. And two weeks later, he announces Y Combinator. And this was a chance, first time it had ever been launched, where he basically said, look, we're going to give six grand per founder to people who have a good idea and some basic programming ability to start a company with the idea that it could one day be worth billions of dollars. At the time, this was crazy. But we thought, shit, we're going to get $12,000 from this guy. That's going to last us for a year at least. And we can actually start this company and not have to do side jobs and all this other stuff. So we go up to interview. And I look, I've given a lot of interviews. I've had to do a lot of this stuff before. And we prepped. We felt so good. You all have been there, right? You go into that meeting. You go into that, you've prepped. You've done all the homework. You feel so good. Yes, this good. <laughs> and you know. Everything is right. So we go into that meeting, we pitch, mm. you know, Paul was there. He'd already heard the pitch before. He already liked it. And we walked out of there feeling amazing. So that night, they called us up and said, congratulations, we're rejecting you. 
And they didn't say it like that. That would have been really rude. But they did say that, that we weren't in. And that was disappointing. So we drank a lot. And the next morning, with the bad hangover, we're on a train back to Virginia when Paul called me back. And he said, look. I was like, <clears throat> actually, the phone rang. And I was like, hello? And he said, Alexis, we still don't like your idea. I'm like, did you call me just to say that? That's really, that's really fucked up, man. That's not cool. He's like, no, no, no. We, we still don't like your idea, but we like you too. Uh, it's way too early for mobile. There's no way this is going to work with restaurants right now. Do something in a browser that you would use every morning and we'll fund you. I'm like, okay, all right. My mobile menu is dead. Long live whatever we're doing next. Hung up, went back to Boston, spent an hour with Paul, just thinking, like, what can we do? What's, what do we start our days with? Um, Steve would read Slashdot every morning. I would open up a bunch of tabs in my browser, read a bunch of news sites, but neither one of us felt like we had a good feel for what was the pulse of, of news, because it was no longer going to be on one front page. Uh, it mattered for hundreds of years what was on the front page of the leading papers, because that was the most important news of the day, as decided by a handful of editors who said, yeah, that's it. Uh, the internet is agnostic. Right? The internet's most interesting news of the day could actually be that little girl's cute video of her puppy. You can feel about that what you want, but millions of people are deciding with their clicks what is interesting and what is relevant. We could build a platform that would let people do that at scale. But back then, we were just two random, just graduated from college kids, one of whom, really bad decision, decided to make a shirt with the logo before we even built anything yet. Don't do that. I don't know why. I just really, I really, I designed our mascot. I was bored in class, and I made a shirt out of it. But Snoo stuck around, thankfully. That's Steve, my co-founder on the side, and and we resolved to just build this thing. And the first version of Reddit was ugly. This was three weeks of programming. PG told us we had to launch or we were hosed because we're waiting too long. And this is a good lesson for all of you founders. Please, please, please launch. You'll never know if you've even gotten close to making something people want until you actually have people potentially using it. That's the first version of Reddit. You see that I have negative one karma. <laughs> That's because Steve is a dick, and he downvoted <laughs> the first ever submission to Reddit from me, his co-founder. And we were in the same room, so like I knew who it was. We hadn't told anyone else about the website yet. It was, it was very clear who it was. Uh, fun fact, though, the first ever submission to Reddit was a link to the Downing Street memo. Um, that in, I guess it was June of 2005, had just sort of surfaced, was making the rounds in the press, and I thought, all right, why not? This should be the first submission. Um, maybe a little prophetic of, of things to come, but what was, I think, most compelling was once it actually started working, we realized this thing that was still, had a lot of work to go, was useful enough for people. And the, the thing that I see, I've invested now in over 200 early stage startups, and I've advised thousands more through Y Combinator. And one of the quintessential failings of founders is this resistance to launch, this resistance to ship, this resistance to share this thing with the world because, oh no, someone might copy it. Well, the reality is ideas are a dime a dozen and execution is what is going to matter. And even when you launch, when you think you're ready, if it's a good enough idea, people are still going to copy it. And that's fine. You just have to do better. What enough people don't realize, or what not enough people realize, is that like Facebook, when it first launched, looked like this. I don't know if you guys remember, this is, it had the creepy Zuckerberg face in the top left. You see that? Who thought that was a good idea? You can imagine, you can totally imagine Zuckerberg at his computer being like, this is great. The people are going to love this. I'm going to put my face in the corner and ones and zeros everywhere. They're going to want to share every photo they ever took. Like, like uh, thankfully, someone stepped up and was like, you have to get rid of that creepy face staring at people while they're uploading their photos. Um, that's the first Facebook janky. Uh, Twitter, whew. Seriously, I'm not making this up. The stock just fell another 20% because I showed how <laughs> awful this was. Oh, and the fake like graffiti text, uh, terrible. But the reality is, if it solves a problem, it's worth shipping. Even the first Iron Man was janky. The Mark I, you know what I'm talking about. That thing was janky as hell, but it solved a problem. So take a lesson from Tony Stark. Um, one of my favorite examples, of course, is Airbnb. Um, this company is now worth like over $30 billion, and when it started, it was three recent college kids who, who were looking to make some money to keep paying their rent, 
by giving up some floor space in their apartment for a conference that was in town in San Francisco, throwing down a couple air mattresses and saying, hey, give us some money, we'll give you a bed and breakfast. They actually had giving people breakfast as part of the original air bed and breakfast scheme. They eventually dropped that because they realized people really just wanted the space. Um, but this is how it started. And, and it was started at the height of the recession. This was the batch of Y Combinator where Paul Graham went to all the founders and said, look, we may not even do a demo day because there may not be any investors who even show up. And this is the most successful company to come out of Y Combinator. So if you want to talk about starting a business and whether or not it's, it's counter cyclical, cyclical, like it does not matter. This, the most valuable company to be started uh, in the last decade or so of Y Combinator, which has had a lot of successes, was started at the height of the recession uh, by these three folks who now, six years later, fill more beds than Hilton, Marriott, and I think also Starwood, because now they're part of Marriott combined. And they didn't have to build a single hotel, they just realized people had space, and they could build a platform that introduced accountability at a market. Uh, and this, you can see, is a little Last Supper style photo of a bunch of the founders. Um, but $80 billion of value has been created by YC Investments over the last 11 years, and all with the same relatively small checks. And this is partially a testament to YC's ability to attract great founders, but more importantly, it's a testament to what technology has done in terms of allowing entrepreneurs to create tremendous value starting from very, very little. This idea of creating this much this many jobs, this much value creation, this much everything from so little would be unheard of in any other age. But today we almost take it for granted that like literally right now you could be alt tabbing into another window, writing code for some billion dollar company, like right now. No factory, no labor, no cost, no, no handshake from a buddy, like you just start writing code. And it's affected venture capital. I live in San Francisco now, I miss New York dearly, but I live in SF now, and what's so clear is this, this, this change is still permeating. It's still sending echoes, not just through the economy in the Bay Area, but also broadly. Uh, San Francisco is not the only place you need to be to start one of these companies. It wasn't 10 years ago. I mean, we didn't start Reddit in San Francisco, but it's become less so with every passing year. And what's so interesting is like they're getting cheaper and cheaper to start. And what I find so heartening is this is not the place where deals get done. This is not the place where business gets done. Historically, I mean, I look, much respect, the outfits are kind of fun, the golf carts are kind of cool to ride around in, but this was historically like the domain of where business got done, right? You had to know the right person to get the hookup to get the thing, but today, uh, it, it could not be less the case. Uh, in fact, I'm really fond of saying that in the Industrial Revolution, you had to open a factory to change the world, and today, you just need to open a laptop. And when you consider the repercussions of this, that you don't need the capital, that you don't need the labor, that you don't need a lot of things that are normally barriers to entry for entrepreneurs, it's pretty awesome. Because the limits are uh, pretty limitless, as represented by this lovely illustration of a kid pretending to fly. Um, Reddit has been an amazing part of my life, and we sold it in 2006. I stayed until 2010. I left, I went to Armenia, I'm Armenian, so I went to the motherland, volunteered for a little bit. Then I went and started another company, got into investing, wrote a book, and then a year ago came back with my co-founder, Steve, who's our CEO. And Reddit for the last like six years was basically like Han frozen in that carbonite where the product did not improve, did not change at all for like six years. And in the last year, we've been able to ship more code than in Reddit's last like six years. And it's been amazing to watch. Now we have native mobile apps, we've got mobile web, we've built a bunch of modern, fast, great things that our users love. Engagement rates, ratings are off the charts. And Reddit's finally starting to do a lot of the things that it should have done like six years ago. So we still have a lot of work to do, and I'm grateful for all the doors that it has opened for me. Um, but there's a long way to go. And I know when I first agreed to come here, it was through Redditors, I actually got a message through Reddit, that was awesome. Um, but what I realize is, there is still so much more potential in terms of entrepreneurship. And I know about Silicon Roundabout. Um, I think the most exciting thing for me is that of all the places I go, like no, as long as I'm talking to someone who has that access and that ability and, and a laptop basically, they have that chance and they have that opportunity to create something. And Reddit in so many ways was a combination of so much serendipity, of so much good luck, of so much good fortune. And I feel like now we sit at this time when there is this new literacy um, 
And if you'd been around when Gutenberg's printing press first started rolling, and you were one of the people who had access to the tools or to the books, to the ideas, right, that were being codified in text and print, and you had the ability to read and to write, you had a fucking superpower. And if I could go back in time, I would kill Hitler, and then I would go back and tell all those people, like, this is the, this is the, this is the thing to take advantage of. This is the thing that will let people gain ideas, learn, and, as well as share them and disseminate them, and hopefully democratize it as much as possible. Today, programming is that new literacy, and the difference it will make in the lives of people who have access to it and those who don't will be vast. We're already seeing that multiplier effect. And it's not just 20-year-old, 20 20-something 20 billionaires like Evan Spiegel. That's a part of it. But it's more broadly the fact that if you are capable of this new literacy of, of programming, you can pretty much chart whatever career you want. And anything that turns on is going to have code. Every industry is going to be affected by software. And you all are among some of the brightest minds here in the UK. And so if I can infect you all with anything, even if you never want to start a company, even if you never want to use Reddit, although I hope you'll download our app, it is that this can have such a big impact on our society, and I hope we don't squander it, because I want to benefit from the best ideas from as many people as possible. So thank you. My um, Q&A is starting now. So thanks. Thank you so much for that. I'll start off with a few questions and then we'll open it up to you guys. I just wanted to pick on something you said about launching the content policy mm -hmm. and what the motivation behind that was basically because mm -hmm. especially in Oxford there's such a debate about free speech and what censorship and all those kind mm -hmm. of things and just how did that play into the motivation behind doing a content policy? Sure. Um, when Steve and I came back it was an opportunity to basically refound the company and part of this is metaphorical and part of this is literal. And something like the content policy would be a good literal example of it. Um, I think one of the things that companies struggle with when the founders leave, and that Reddit did especially, was there was not a kind of like a moral authority to just say like, hey, we should change this. And so instead, you have people who are put in a really difficult position where the site keeps growing and they don't want to screw it up. And I think that's a big part of why it calcified in the way that it did. And changes that should have happened a lot sooner didn't. And so when we came back, we could say, okay, what do we want Reddit to be? We want Reddit to be a place where people can, at the same time, feel as free as possible to express themselves, but also invite as many people as possible to feel free to express themselves. And those are not, I mean, there, there, are, there is a very, very constant friction between those two things. And outlining a content policy was the first step to helping develop that, because it wasn't gonna be perfect. Um, we, we think of it, it's an amendable document, um, like a constitution, um, where we know we aren't gonna get it perfect the first time, but as we learn and we evolve, we can improve upon it. But that was the only starting point we could have if we wanted to build a trust and safety team, which the Reddit did not have before, um, to build out a proper community team, which Reddit did not have before. And that was really, really important, because if we, if we wanna be a platform that genuinely wants to be a home for, or f to allow anyone to find their home, to find their community, um, we have to have like some rules of the road and be able to enforce them. Do you feel like that's something that other sites should use, like Twitter? Do you think it's an obligation? I think it's difficult. It's really hard across platforms just because of the nature of the platforms. And what I mean by that is Reddit is ultimately a platform of communities. There are tens of thousands of communities. The, uh, um, I don't know, the West Ham community has its own language and its own culture and its own, like they, like they, they have a, a history, right? They have just like an offline community, um, which is different from like the blep community, which is where cats stick out their tongue halfway and they take a photo and share it. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, blepping. Um, and, and so there are these community dynamics that come into play because we have moderators who have to follow our overarching content policy, but also create their own guidelines and etiquette. Like it would be ridiculous <laughs> to, it would be, actually, it's a, I think it's a bannable offense to post a dog blepping on r slash blep because they've decided photos of dogs is, is banned, okay. But there is a community dynamic that's built into it that we all kind of learn as community creatures. Um, one of the biggest challenges Twitter has is because as a platform, it is essentially giving individuals megaphones. It's not a community platform, it's an individual amplification platform. And so 
there's not the same kind of social, I don't know, there's not the same kind of social uh, uh, friction that there is because yeah, if you hand someone a megaphone, they feel like, okay, I've got a megaphone, I'll just use it. Whereas if you tell someone, hey, come into this community center, there's already a kind of norm, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily walk into the West Ham pub shouting, yeah, Manchester United rocks, you guys suck. Um, you might, depending on what you're starting to, you know, what kind of fight you want to start. But um, that, it, it, it absolutely varies across platforms. And like I said, we are still, we're still improving and learning uh, ourselves. So I guess that kind of then ties into the whole idea of privacy and security and your moral duties, I guess, as a platform to everyone. How do you think that's extrapolated out to the wider internet? Should it be public, public, like, publicly regulated? Should there be, what's the balance between privacy, privacy and security? Oh man, <laughs> um, that is another one that we are still, we are not as close as I would like us to be in the US. Um, I think there is still, when it comes to digital privacy, I don't think we as a public fully appreciate how important it is. Um, and I, it's hard to articulate because our digital privacy is much more, it's much more than just our sort of digital version of our mailbox. Now, I think fundamentally uh, here in the UK as well as in the States, we would want to see due process if someone in the government wanted to go through our mail and our mailbox. I realize a lot of you may not have any idea what mail in a mailbox is, but uh, physical things postman would take, okay. Uh, the, the analogy kind of makes sense digitally where it's like, okay, email, this is the digital equivalent of it, all right. Um, but then it starts to get a little murkier for a lot of people because they may not appreciate uh, how much a lot of the more subtle data that we give off or create matters. And the digital world is more and more becoming an extension of our own minds. And I think a lot of the mentality behind why we appreciate privacy, and, and, and certainly in the West, is because those were our spaces to be ourselves. Like that was where we could be our creative self and know that someone from the government wasn't gonna have a problem with something because we just thought about it, because we painted a picture that they didn't like. Um, and as more and more of our s sort of overt thinking as well as subtle thinking happens digitally, and that's everything from the photos we take to the tracking of our location. Um, there's more and more of a responsibility for that privacy to be protected, in my opinion. And we're lucky at Reddit because the only information we ask of people is a username, which is just made up, and an email, which is optional. Um, and so we've had instances where if, if, you know, if people come knocking, like they're looking around, but there's nothing to give. And, uh, and that's a nice insulation. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't internationalized yet, but I think one of the reasons why we're looking forward to it is we have this, we have this distinction um, that's, that you know, platforms like Google and Facebook just don't have because their entire business is predicated on storing and knowing all of this stuff about us. And, uh, and that's just very, very sticky. Great, so I think we'll open up to audience questions now. If anyone wants to answer a question, please raise your hand, wait until the microphone comes around and stand up so we can see you. And if we go to down here on the front row. Thank you. I've read that you've uh, studied history in university, so I wonder to what extent did um, the knowledge that you obtained from your history degree help you develop um, Reddit and in what ways? Sure, all right, so yes, you, spoiler, yeah, I was a history major. Um, I studied, I studied post-World War II German history, um, so, you know, East-West, it's, it's like, it, it was, it was so amazing to be able to see, and I also, I grew up speaking German, don't hold it against me, my mother was German, and, uh, and so it was so amazing to see this dichotomy in terms of how entire cultures and societies were affected by two very different ruling ideologies uh, between the East and the West. I also did my thesis, although it was not technically post-World War II, on the bombing of Dresden, which I know is a whole other, whole other thing. Um, what was so helpful for me doing that degree, far more helpful than my business major in an entrepreneurial capacity, was, was the ability or the exercise in taking large disparate amounts of data and trying to turn that into a cohesive and compelling story. 
And a lot of the work that I do, whether it's internally or whether it's externally, is, is connecting those dots and telling those stories and, and hopefully being a good communicator of them. Uh, whereas my business degree was virtually worthless in entrepreneurship because it was all just things for like a middle management job. Like here's one-on-one accounting, here's one-on-one finance. It wasn't very practical for an entrepreneur. Um, that said, do I wish I'd kept, I, I took like three programming classes while I was in college. I was an avid programmer until I got to college and met Steve who was a CS major and I felt so dwarfed intellectually when it came to programming chops that I just, I, I backed off being a, a CS major. Um, I'm still grateful that I got that history degree, and then, sort of with the business degree, but, uh, but that's one thing I definitely would have invested in a lot more when I was in college, especially when I had the free time. And I wouldn't have cared so much about my GPA. That was dumb. I wasted so much energy on my GPA. Don't do that. <laughs> do you all have other GPAs? Not really, we just have like exams at the end. Oh, okay, see, I feel like such a muggle. All right, that's, that's my last one, I promise. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so okay. much for your question. Anyone else? If we come to down here on the front. So I'm wondering, given that President Obama has more or less been the most positive president for kind of the tech community, so doing things like having a chief data scientist, a mm -hmm. chief technological officer, do you think that that's going to continue in the upcoming administration, no matter who wins? Mm. As in, is that, is that like a permanent movement that you see in the U.S. government? Huh. All right. I am, I'm trying not to let my personal biases color this, I, because I hope so. It needs to be. The only way we had some nearly disastrous bills like SOPA and PIPA nearly become the law of the land in the United States, simply because of the ignorance of the people in government. And I understand technology is intimidating, I get it, um, but until tech issues become sort of default in the, in the minds of politicians, because yeah, until those become just sort of standards, like you just have to have someone on your team who understands this and who can at least explain it to you and know that a lot of your voters, a lot of your constituents really, really care about it, uh, we're gonna continue to have to fight these sorts of things because it will just continue to come up and come up. So. I do hope that whoever wins continues that trend. Um, do I think it'll happen? I don't know. Um, it has been, I, I would say actually both candidates have not been as strong talking about tech as I would like them to be. For presidential candidates in 2016, well, of the two sort of leading ones, um, neither Senator Clinton nor, nor Donald Trump um, have been really, really strong about it. And who knows, I guess that'll change depending on who ends up president. Um, but the, the trend is overall in the right direction, so I don't think we'll take a step back. I think it's just a question of whether or not we continue on this nice linear trend um, and just kind of keep at it, keep plodding along, or we get someone who really invests in it heavily and makes it a priority and makes it something that really bumps us up in terms of awareness and, and, and promoting the best of it. Um, and maybe pardoning Edward Snowden too. <laughs> Why do you think tech so, is so scary to governments? Is it a generational thing? Oh, I think it's a whole combination. I think about it every time I help my dad with his computer. I think part of it is just fluency and, and the, it's just the difference between growing up with the technology and taking it for granted. It's, it, what it comes down to is it's kind of like a, I think it, I don't know if it's fluency or it's patience. I mean, the, the reality is that there is no difference between me and my dad when we're confronted with a, a technology problem. The, the big difference, because I, like, I don't know everything, I just feel comfortable going to Google and figuring it out. And that's the leap. And, and it's that difference of being able to say, okay, I'm stymied, there's a solution. Somewhere on the internet, someone's figured it out, they've made a YouTube video, or there's a Google search, or I can, can self-teach basically to, to hack my way around this. And I think having that, that switch flipped makes all the difference. And, and then I think the other part of it, frankly, is that it represents something that is very, very, uh, I hate to use the term, but disruptive. Um, there are going to be politicians, uh, certainly, so the, you know, lots of issues with U.S. governance, um, but it takes a lot of money to run for office in the U.S. And uh, there are gonna be politicians who are able to, through primarily grassroots organizing, I mean, Bernie Sanders came, came remarkably close to it, um, using, 
I mean, just individual donors and grassroots organizing online. I mean, President Obama did it his first two runs, but we're seeing that amplify. There are going to be candidates who are able to actually run for office without being beholden to big donors or super PACs, which are just creative, legal clusterfucks. Um, that, that allow special interests to have a really, really strong influence in helping candidates because you needed the money. If this money is just getting spent on television ads and other things that aren't actually moving, like change, aren't actually getting people to vote, um, a lot of that power goes away. And so I think that's also a real threat. And in the same way that businesses have had to adapt to it, governments have had to adapt to it, you can point to tons of examples all over the world, um, but we're still very, very, very far from it living up to its full potential. And, and I don't think technology alone can solve everything. I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm not a hardcore utopian uh, tech believer. Cool. OK, if we go about three rows back. Yeah, <laughs> leaning out, yeah. Hi. Um, Hello. So I was quite tempted to ask the question in German, because I'm actually German, but it wouldn't oh. be very nice to everyone else, I suppose. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> Auf Deutsch. <laughs> Auf Deutsch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not a very intellectual question, but it's one that I've been interested in for a few years. Um, and I, I guess it has to do with the, the policy that you were speaking about, but not really. Mm -hmm. So usually I go to Reddit for information, and that's usually subjective information. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hmm, how do other people feel about this? Have mm -hmm. other people had this problem? Yeah. What I usually do is I Google it, and then I end up on all these other pages, and people just start fighting, and they give really stupid answers, and they don't know grammar, and it just frustrates me. Mm -hmm. And every time I go to Reddit, it's a completely different discussion, and I wonder how you curate that. Uh, I, well, I certainly can't take credit for it personally. Uh, I, it goes back to those community norms, and it goes back to the precedent that is set. Uh, an amazing, amazing community. Two really exemplary ones are Ask Historians and Change My View. And both of them have a really great set of moderators, volunteers who are like the community organizers who set a standard and basically say like, you can't comment on this thread unless you're including a citation. And it's amazing because again, you don't expect this should not happen at scale with millions of people, but it does because a little bit of community enforcement, a little bit of, of tools like software that we build to make it easier to scale that, and then just social norms. Um, all kind of wrapped together to make this thing that, that works. Um, I mean, Change My View is a, is a community of people, a few hundred thousand, who show up just to have their view changed about something. And it could be silly, like dogs are better than cats, which is just silly, because cats are clearly better than dogs. Or it could be, I think one of the top voted ones is about warrantless wiretapping. And it was a person who said, look, I'm totally OK. I have nothing to hide. Let the government look through all my stuff. Change my view. And what you see in these threads is actually people building substantive arguments, voting up the best stuff. And in some cases, actually, the original poster is saying, OK, you know what? You changed my view. And it's this, these are these little miracles that happen daily that I don't know, at least I would like to think I would be capable of. Like, I would like, like I'd like to think my best self would be able to do this, um, but I still struggle to. Um, and yet there are people doing it online, pseudonymously on Reddit every day. And, and that's the stuff that really gives me hope because that's, I mean, when Sir Tim Berners-Lee was kicking around the whole World Wide Web, I mean, this was part of the hope and the ambition. And if we can fulfill even a little fraction of what all those amazing people did, uh, that's really cool. And that's, I mean, that's why we're, that's why we're back at Reddit. Thank you so much for your question. Mm -hmm. If we come to down here in the red on the front row. Um, yes, um, I'm from Indonesia, and I just want to ask, um, because you're saying that Reddit is planning to actually go global, mm -hmm. but as you can see, like some countries actually banned some websites. For example, Indonesia has banned Reddit, so I cannot open Reddit in Indonesia. It's, yeah. kinda, um, it's got bad. So how do you actually like, um, go through and penetrate uh, many countries um, without losing the integrity that they have maintained for many years? Yeah. So. We are, we are, I think we are still banned in Indonesia. Yeah, it's, um, I don't have a good answer. And it, it's the truth though, which is we have not thought about it at all. Like we, we're still trying very hard just to improve the product for English speakers because there was so much work to be done. Like, so we didn't have a mobile app until three months ago. So internationalizing was not gonna happen until we had at least a mobile app and a mobile website. Um, 
So we have not thought about it. Um, I think it is going to be it is going to be a challenge for us because you're right. The integrity of the platform matters so much. I mean, the reason people come and trust a review of some sneakers on Reddit or some opinion or whatever is because it feels authentic, even though it is. I mean, it's voted up by a bunch of peers, random people on the internet. It's not experts, um, but it is what it is, and it feels meaningful. Uh, going somewhere where we'd have to compromise on that feels like a showstopper from the very beginning, but we just literally haven't even haven't even thought about it. Um, I was, I guess, pleasantly surprised to find that we are not banned in China, but I think that's just because we don't have much market penetration. But I was in Beijing and I was like, I gotta check, and it worked. So I was like, okay. But then I felt kind of bad because I feel like you haven't really made it until you get banned <laughs> in China. So um, the one thing on a, on a, from a macro standpoint, speaking like personally, that does make me feel good is that, you know, VPNs, there are, there are, there's so many tools that people have access to that even, I mean, even today, right, there are people behind the Great Firewall who are still circumventing that using technology. And long term, I always will bet on distributed individuals um, when it comes to technology because the internet itself is sort of designed to route around that kind of censorship. And what makes me so hopeful is that people want information and technology, the, the technology, the underlying technology itself wants to route around that and combine that with creative people building tools, always trying to stay one step ahead. Um, that part from a macro standpoint makes me feel positive. Um, but yeah, in the short term, it's really shitty. Thank you for your question. I think we've got time for maybe a couple more. If we go um, here on the front row. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just had a quick question about, so you mentioned your first startup idea, like the hmm yes. um, uh, idea. Um, and you know, that seemed to serve like a very clear purpose in your mind to like solve you know, the cues that you hated. Mm -hmm. to, to what extent you know, did Reddit also you know, have that clear sort of problem solving thing in mind? Uh, and to what extent did that sort of develop over time? So, mm was very straightforward, you're right. Because it was a very obvious thing. Um, with Reddit, you know, we really didn't have much of a purpose for at least the first six months. Um, we just, our purpose was like not failing and, 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 and make something that's interesting enough that people who aren't our friends will visit. Like that's it. And so it was a lot of it was a hunch. Um, I think it was also a lot easier to start that way back in 2005 because there was less competition. And, and I would not, I think, I think there are a lot of founding stories that get rewritten so that the founders are sitting there and all, they're, like, they're under the tree and all of a sudden enlightenment happens and they're like, I see it, this is our future. But it, it absolutely was not the case for us. And it was probably about six months in when it was just working. I mean, because Steve and I faked, we were, we were the only two users on the site for the first month. And so we just faked different usernames so that you would see multiple submissions from different people. We didn't have comments, so it's not like I was saying, brilliant comment, Alexis. It wasn't that bad, but we were submitting under different usernames, so if you showed up, you would see a room, you'd see a hall that was full and not one that was empty, and so maybe you'd be more inclined to show up, and we could also kind of set the tone for, you know, it was a lot of world news, it was, it was fairly highbrow-ish stuff. I mean, Downing Street Memo was the first post. It wasn't like, here's a cat photo. It very quickly became cat photos, but um, we at least set it there. And that really calcified when we realized it just worked. And it was providing something really meaningful for people to the point where, yeah, the site went down a lot in the first year. Um, we would get all these emails, a flurry of emails, first thing in the morning from people who said, help, something's wrong, I can't get, Red like Reddit won't load, I don't know what to do. Like I don't, this is, this is how I start my day. And then we thought, oh shit, like maybe this is actually, maybe we haven't, just not screwed up. Maybe we've made something special. Um, but we only came to realize the real, this idea that people can find their home on Reddit and find a community on Reddit, that, that evolved over years. That was not, it was not a grandiose vision from the very start. It was like, don't screw up. And I think a lot of founders 
get hung up on these founder myths. I mean, look, Zuckerberg started Facebook so he could what, like creep on random girls in his, his college class? Like, it's really unfortunate, but like, that was the initial impetus for it. And I think, I think as long as you're solving a real problem, it may not feel it may not feel like it has this world-changing mission, but if it solves a real problem for enough people, it's already better than 99% of stuff that gets launched, which doesn't actually have an audience, doesn't actually solve a problem for anyone. And that's, that's the starting point you need. Brilliant, thank you so much. So, last question. If we go to um, <coughs> over here on the second row, back, blonde hair. Yeah. Right, um, if there was one language you had to recommend, regardless of what you need to build websites. Um, yeah. What would that be? Well, I would say the most, you would probably get the best head start and the most responsive feedback um, probably from JavaScript and HTML because you could at least, like the barrier to entry is so low with building a website there and there are so many tutorials. Like you, I mean, Codecademy is probably one of the most prolific ones where literally you just see a terminal and you start learning how to program. Um, but using something web-based, like just even just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript will allow you to make a website that is a thing that you have created from a blank canvas into something you could show your friends and family. And as soon as you can get that little bit of dopamine and get that little hook and realize like the best programmers are just good at using Google and Stack Overflow to find answers, <laughs> like that's it. It's not, it's actually, I mean it is, that is not to trivialize programming. Great programming is very hard, but a lot of it is, it, it is, it is not hard because um, this knowledge hasn't been done before. I mean, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and what you'll find with a couple of queries is you're like, how do I make a button that does this thing? And then you'll literally type that into Google or Stack Overflow and find an example of how to make that button do that thing. And then you'll do it yourself and be like, you know what, I actually wanna make this button blue. And you'll be like, how do I make that blue? Okay, and, and it becomes this iterative like Lego thing where there are a bunch of sets you can pick up off the shelf and be like, oh cool, someone already made this Lego kit, now I've got a castle. And then you're like, all right, how did they make that castle? And you can start to reverse engineer it. And before long you realize like, wow, I actually understand how these Legos form together. And, and, and it becomes, like I said, it becomes kind of addictive. Um, but that's what I would recommend. Web development, you could literally, I mean, you could, you, could, you, you could be building tonight your first website. And if you do, you should send it to me. And then I will tweet it out. And then, I don't know, I, who knows what will happen after that. Then you'll start, a sell, you'll start a startup and sell it for billions of dollars and then give me credit for launching on that career. Hopefully. <laughs> That was non-committal in terms of you giving me credit for your career, but that's all right. <laughs> yes, okay, all right, I'll take it. Well, I think that's all we've got time for tonight, I'm afraid, but please do join me in thanking Alexis Ohanian. Thank you.